Hello, my name is Rick Houston, and welcome to the Scene Vault Podcast, your source for all things NASCAR history. We are one of those couples, as far as a crew chief driver relationship, that we've been married, divorced, married, divorced <laughs> several times. We were trying to, uh, you know, make it a fond, farewell, memorable deal, and unfortunately, you know, the wheel come off the wagon. It's not the toughest thing I ever went through, but damn close to it. The day NASCAR and all of us associated in any way with NASCAR forget its past, that's the day we don't have any future. Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Wade. And my name is Rick Houston, and welcome to the Scene Vault Podcast. A few weeks back, I got a message from a guy by the name of Boo Carlisle asking if it would be okay if he put our podcast logo on his race car. And I told him I didn't have any decals, but Boo responded and said that he would take care of getting the decal. So sure, have at it. (laughs) And I didn't think anything else about it until Boo tweeted us a photo last week. And Steve, there we are, the Scene Vault podcast on the right rear quarter panel of his beautiful race car. And maybe best of all, on an old school open trailer. I have seen that picture and that logo looks great on that car. Makes me kind of wonder where he got it, you know? But let me say something else. This is a great name for a stock car driver. Boo Carlisle. I love it. (laughs) Way to go, Boo. Well, Steve, we haven't even discussed the fact that his car number is B double (laughs) zero. Double zero. Somewhere out there, Buckshot Jones has a single manly tear falling down his cheek when he sees that double zero, the Scene Vault podcast sponsored race car out on the racetrack. But Boo hosts this really cool vlog called Kicking Asphalt. And in that vlog, he basically takes viewers behind the scenes of what it takes to get his race car from the shop there in Northern Georgia to the racetrack. And they race all over the place. Last week, they raced at Lonesome Pine Speedway up in Coburn, Virginia. And Steve, my mama was born in Coburn. I've been to Lonesome Pine years ago when it first opened. With that being where my mama was from, I still have family in the area. I've got several cousins who still live up there. I really wanted to go up there, but that was July 3rd. And the local parade was here in town. And then the local fireworks were here in Yakinville. And of course we missed that last year because of COVID and I just didn't feel like I could skip out on all that and leave my family and everything. So I didn't get to go to Lonesome Pine, but Boo is also racing this coming Saturday night at Hickory Motor Speedway Uh where I have covered several races. And so I believe that you and I both are going to be there to support Boo and see that race car out on the racetrack. I hope we are, man. That would be great to see Boo and to see that race car. And I haven't been to Hickory in years. That would be a lot of fun. Hey, wait a second. I just thought of something. (laughs) I wonder if Hickory needs a pace car driver Saturday night. (laughs) Oh, no. Here we go again. You be the lookout. I'll steal the keys of the pace car, and we'll have ourselves a big time. (laughs) You're on your own on that one. Butch and Sundance, right again. (laughs) Steve, this week in our first segment, we are going to wrap up our time with Jeff Hammond with a pretty short 15-minute installment in which Jeff talks about his time with Sapco Racing and Kenny Wallace. He talks about going back to work with Daryl Waltrip. And then finally, he talks about his move into the wide, wide world of NASCAR television with Fox. Jeff is one of the first guys on board over there at Fox, and he did a very good job. Most of the time, we heard Jeff down in the quote, unquote, Hollywood Hotel with Chris Myers. They did some great stuff down there. Then in our second segment, we're going to go back to the April 9th, 1998 issue of Winston Cup Scene. That issue featured coverage of a quite memorable weekend at Texas Motor Speedway and not. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> underline not <laughs> and not for all the right reasons there was water coming up through the racetrack in turn one drivers still weren't happy about turn four being too narrow following the track's debut there the year before after all the carnage that weekend was said and done 
nearly 40 cars, 40 cars, Steve, had been damaged in some shape, form, or fashion, and several drivers were actually hospitalized. Yeah, it was a wild weekend there at Texas, and uh, Texas brought a lot of this on itself, as you'll find out. To make matters even worse, NASCAR and Speedway Motorsports, they were already pretty much... I don't know how else to put it. They were already pretty much at war over Texas getting a second race weekend. And these issues didn't help matters at all. And Bill France Jr. and Mike Helton both hinted that Bruton Smith and Eddie Gossage needed to basically worry about coming back to Texas for the first time (laughs) rather than getting a second date. So it was pretty heated between those two entities at that time. Well, Bill France flew up to Texas because he was not very happy with what was going on. And when he got there, he didn't see the progress he wanted to see and got pretty well fed up with Bruton about what was going on at the track. He didn't want to hear about a second date. Of course, I knew that Dell Earnhardt Jr. won his first Bush Series race that weekend in Texas. But I did not put two and two together. I didn't put the fury with the racetrack and the weepers and all the carnage that was going on. I didn't put two and two together, and that being the weekend that Dale Earnhardt Jr. won his first race. I didn't put those two together for some reason in my mind. In this issue, there were also features on Tim Flock's passing, and just a couple of weeks ago, we had talked about Tim Flock overseeing a Winston Cup team that never came to be. There were also features in this issue on Wendell Scott and the longevity of various racing chassis that teams took to the racetrack. Finally, Steve, this week, we have new Patreon support from Andrew Bonter, C.P. Dobbs, and Porky Wilson. Is so Porky Andrew, Wilson another driver? <laughs> <laughs> well, if not, he should be. <laughs> <laughs> and Steve, we also have PayPal help from Scott Armnick. Andrew, C.P., Porky, and Scott, thank y'all. Listeners, if you can, please support us on Patreon, support us on PayPal. If you can do a monthly contribution, you can do that at patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash the Seam Vault Podcast. Or if you would prefer just to do a one-time show of support, you can do that via paypal.me slash the Seam Vault Podcast. You mentioned rambling around. Uh, you do move over to Sabco, but the success mm-hmm. doesn't come as easily as it seemed to earlier in your career. Did you consider that just part of the process of building a new team, or were you frustrated and disappointed maybe with how things worked out? Well, I mean, it's like you're always going to be frustrated when, you, when you're used to being able to be successful. And here again, this is where one of life's lessons is, is that sometimes you know, what you've got doesn't allow you to be that successful. You know, sometimes you make a decision to um, to better yourself, and not always can you better yourself. You you do the best you can, and uh, unfortunately, I'd been with two drivers that were almost like automatic about getting to victory lane. Yeah. And then you get a driver, and, and again, no, no, just not knocking Kenny any way, shape, or form. I love Kenny Wallace. When people understand it, I love Kenny Wallace. But he was still young, and he was still developing. So, Jeff, you did go back and work with Daryl again in 1996 and 97. After enjoying the kind of success that you'd had with him, what were those years like for you? Uh, They were good, uh, but difficult. I mean, it was still – unfortunately, I've never – work with somebody in the latter part of their career and dealing with some of the things that he was dealing with as, you know, it was, I'm going to use the term, it was time, you know, and it happens to everybody. I mean, you know, Richard Petty, Pearson, Yarborough, all the greats. I mean, you know, it, it's, you lose that little bit of hand and eye coordination and that little bit more part of a, the will to lay it all out there on the line. And and it, and it was just catching up with him. So, you know, we tried to capture some uh, magic, and we, we did the best we could. And other than that, I mean, it was um, – it's always good whenever you can um, come back and get a little more peace of mind than maybe when you left the first time or the second time. 
<laughs> it's it's we laugh about it. We we are one of those couples as far as a crew chief driver relationship that we've been married, divorced, married, divorced <laughs> several times. Yeah. But uh, no, it, it was uh, it was good to be around him and work with him. You know, late in his career, would have liked to have hit for it to have ended on a different note. Uh, you know, we tried to pull that you know during his twenty fifth anniversary uh, deal, and he he wanted to hang on. He wanted to hang on. Is that something that you talked to him about? Well, I mean, that was kind of like the reason why we went to all of what we did and okay. coming up with the ideas of the cars and everything that was kind of the silver car that we ran. And, you know, it was part of the silver anniversary. You know, it just uh, it seemed logical, and it, it, we were trying to uh, you know make it a fond farewell, memorable deal. And unfortunately, you know, the wheel come off the wagon. At what point did television come into the picture for you? Uh, you know, I was working for Jack Roush at the time. I had worked for Chad Little and uh, this, you know, in the last part of my career, you know, worked the last uh, seven races uh, with Kurt Busch. And the interim of, I guess it would have been 2000, the deal with Fox was coming together. They made the announcement about uh, hiring Darrell Walter. And then I get a call from from Daryl saying, you know, you you ought to take a look at this. Okay. Um got a couple names and you know made phone calls and they said, Well look, you know, we we you know you haven't done anything major T V work or anything. So we uh, we'd like to get you to come do, you know, some trial runs with us. At that time I went to Jack you know, who I was working for because they wanted me to uh, do something during the 500 at Charlotte, you know, and call a live race, mm -hmm. you know, with, with a couple of people and see how I did. So Jack told me, he said, look, he said, you know, if they're coming in, they're wanting to do all this right here, I think it'll be a great opportunity for you. I understand completely. He said, I wanted to move you into a different role the following year anyway, whenever Kirk came on board. He wanted to bring his cup, I mean, his uh, truck crew chief up and keep those two together because they had a really successful run. I said, cool with me. Yeah. I said, that'd be fine. He said, so you just understand, you go do this deal and it don't work. You come back, I'll find you a manager's role. So that gave me some level of comfort and uh, confidence in what I was doing and went and did the audition. Got a call back saying that they were interested in another audition. And this time I did an audition with Daryl. And a series, I mean, a series of potential hosts, all of them that went through, uh, including, uh, oh, shoot, Rick Allen. That's not Whitney's real name when I first met him, but <laughs> uh, he even, they even tried Rick Allen as a host. And all honesty, we, we did, I think it was seven or eight that day. And Fox didn't like any of them. So... They decided we we're going to do this pre-race deal, and I was going to work with Daryl, and they were going to have a location for us, which wound up being the infield uh, television booth at Daytona, and subsequently what wound up being named the Hollywood Hotel, which was a, a mobile studio that had an elevator on it, as you call it, or a scissor lift type deal. Yeah. But the interesting part about this thing is um, Mr. Hill, David Hill, who was in charge of everything at Fox at that time, brought in Chris Myers. And anybody that watches, you know, Fox NFL, you know, Chris is one of their main players when it comes to uh, broadcasting football as well as some of their other shows that he does. And he knew nothing about racing. And he, we met for the first time in Daytona, that first broadcast. <laughs> and wow. he said, guys, he said, I'm just going to let you know, I'm the dummy in the room. Educate me. Make sure you talk to me on a level that I can understand and every grandma across the country can, you know, communicate with and understand the same thing. So that's kind of how we approached it. He just took care of all the traffic and asking the right questions at the right time. And the rest was history. You go into that race and up until the last half mile of the race, I mean, it's, it's a pretty good event. Yeah. As long as you'd known Dale, 
what was that moment like for you personally to be in a new job, relatively unfamiliar with it, but all of a sudden you are in the middle of the biggest news story that NASCAR has seen in a long, long time? I guess the best way to sum it up, gut-wrenching and nauseating at the same time. Uh, I've seen enough fatalities in this sport to get a pretty good assessment that this was not going to end well. Um, with with every passing minute, you know, it got worse and worse and worse. And you did not know whether to show emotion of sorrow or joy because you were hoping it was some kind of miracle was getting ready to happen, and it didn't. Um, I don't know. It, it's just you go from the highest of highs. I mean, it's and to, to hitting rock bottom. I think that was. Uh, it's not the toughest thing I ever went through, but damn close to it, because you know you just. The the question is, you know, how did this happen? Why did this happen? Because it didn't look as bad as I've seen some of them happen. I mean, I'm standing there at Bristol when Michael Walter crashes. I watched that car disintegrate. I know there's nothing but little bitty heat pieces of him. Yeah. And you get up there, you know, Daryl's telling me, my brother's dead, my brother's dead, go, go check on, go check on, see how bad it is. It's like, I don't want to go. You know, it's kind of like saying, I don't want to go. And I get up there and when I stop, Daryl runs over me because he didn't want to go. He just didn't want to go first. And there's Michael afterwards. So, you know, you know, you believe in miracles and I'm hoping for that same kind of miracle and it, and it doesn't happen. I mean, a lot of people don't even probably remember this, but I picked Michael Walter to win that race that day. My first television show and I picked my, Michael Walter to win the Daytona 500 because I liked what I saw that that week. I like, you know, talking about Dale. I mean, his, his bounce and his step, you know, coming back from the 24 hours of Daytona was, wow. I mean, Earnhardt acts like he's 20 years younger than what he is. The confidence of the team, Slugger Labby, Michael, I mean, it was like, we're, we're, we're going to do it today. We're going to break our, break our streak. And I picked him to win. And, and, you know, you couldn't get excited about that. I should have been able to, and I couldn't. So shocking is probably the simplest way to kind of bring it all together right there at the end. You know, it just became shocking. You were in that booth for a lot of years. And a lot of new generation fans, new school fans, mm -hmm. know Jeff Hammond from the Hollywood Hotel. How would you like for race fans to remember you one day? It's a real good question because uh, it, when you put it to me like that, it seems so final. And um, one day, a long time in the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, like I say, it's uh, it's a long way behind and not very far in the future. Uh, I think the easiest way to put it, Rick, is I, I genuinely love the sport. I mean, I love racing. I love so much about the good stuff in it and hate so much about the bad stuff that's still in it. Um, I know with the limited – I mean, here recently my races have gotten less and less actively going to the racetrack. This past year, working in the truck series, rejuvenated me quite a bit because I'm I'm scared of the technology that's come into the sport since I've left it, and I, I didn't know how it'd fit in. But at the end of the day, I felt satisfied that I could hold my own and understand enough to be helpful. And for that reason, here again, I'm I'm back feeling. Satisfied and gratified. I just I enjoy watching the whole the whole game is played from start to finish. 
It's just, you know, just a few minutes ago, I'm out there unloading a truck that's getting ready to be put together to go to Daytona and helping, you know, get the all the parts and pieces in the right place to make it happen, to have that kind of value, that kind of um, need. If somebody needs you help to get it done. So once again, I'm looking forward to the next year and the next challenge. And at the same time, I love uh, what I still have opportunities to do from broadcasting with PRN, Sirius XM Radio, going to Indianapolis and helping call the races at the Brickyard for their network. Um, it's just staying in and close to the game is, is I'll go. I guess I guess to say the easiest thing is it, it continues to give me energy and purpose. So I think really, again, to sum it up, I just want to know that I loved racing. I mean, the good, the bad, and the ugly of all of it. I've lived it, and I still love it. Love it bad. When Jeff Hammond left Daryl Walker's team during the 1992 season, he was going to be putting together a Winston Cup team for Kenny Wallace at Sabco Racing. And Kenny was going to be running for Rookie of the Year honors, but Steve, he was going to be doing it against Jeff Gordon and Bobby Labonte. Well, all I can say is good luck, Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> Well, here's the thing. He's going to be going up against not only two future Winston Cup champions, but he's also going up against two future NASCAR Hall of Famers. Now, of course, nobody knew that at the time. And Jeff and Bobby were every bit as raw as Kenny was. And as a matter of fact, Kenny had been running longer than either one of those guys had been in the Bush series. So it was going to be a tough road to hoe. There's no question about it. That is a fine rookie class right there. We took note of that in the press when the season started. And Bobby and Kenny and Jeff got real scrutiny from the press because they wanted to see how those guys were going to do. There was a whole lot of potential in that small group. And from Jeff Hammond's perspective, he's coming off a run with Junior Johnson and Associates where he had worked with Kel Yarbrough. He had worked with Daryl Waltrip at Junior Johnson and Associates, and at Daryl's own team. And he had also even worked with Terry Labonte for a brief period of time in 1987. So there's Kale and Daryl and Terry, who are three more NASCAR Hall of Famers thrown into the mix. So when you've got the expectations of racing against a Jeff Gordon, a Bobby Labonte, and with a crew chief who had raced with Kale Yarbrough, Daryl Waltrip, and Terry Labonte, that's a pretty tall order. Well, I'll tell you what, Jeff was in some fine company in his career, no doubt about it. But this teaming up with Kenny Wallace in a rookie effort, this is something I think is pretty new for Jeff. Dealing with uh, a rookie driver, I think he had a tough road to hoe there. When Darrell Waltrip joined Junior Johnson and Associates in 1981, Jeff Hammond wasn't quite sure how it was all going to work out with DW because of the fact of the matter was that Jeff didn't much like Darrell. And going back to the first three episode arc with Jeff, Junior actually took Jeff off the road for a little while because of the friction that was taking place between him and Daryl. But then that kind of icy relationship thawed with time and a whole bunch of wins under the belt. And they're singing from the same hymnal <laughs> <laughs> before Daryl leaves to go to Hendrick Motorsports. He leaves Jeff behind, but then. They get remarried in 1987 when Jeff leaves Junior to join Daryl at Hendrick Motorsports, and they win the Daytona 500 together. But the following year, Daryl decides he's going to leave Hendrick Motorsports and start up his own team. Jeff doesn't want to go because he thinks that Daryl is making a huge mistake. So maybe there's a, if not a divorce, there's a separation of sorts. <laughs> <laughs> But then Rick Hendrick tells Jeff that he needs to go help Daryl make a go of it. Jeff and the general manager that Daryl hires, they don't get along. So Jeff leaves Daryl this time. So they're divorced again. So finally, Jeff comes back to work with Daryl in 1997 when Daryl was nearing the end of his driving career. And Jeff said he and Daryl were like one of those couples that keeps getting married and divorced and married and divorced and married and divorced. And yeah, they might love each other, 
but maybe just maybe they don't exactly get along all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just like a marriage. I mean, come on, husbands and wives don't exactly get along all the time, but they stay married. Now, what Jeff described is perfect in terms of separation, reconciliation, separation, reconciliation. <laughs> Hey, man, I get along perfectly well with Jeannie, or at least that's what she tells me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there's a bridge in New York, I want to tell you. <laughs> and I think that Jeff had the understanding that 1997 was going to be Daryl's last year in the seat, and they ran special paint schemes honoring Daryl's career and so forth. But Daryl wanted to hang on a few more years because he just wasn't ready to give up the race car yet. We've talked about this several times before, but driving a race car is as addictive as any drug. And I've heard Daryl, and I know that you've heard Daryl say it, that he was afraid that nobody would care about him when he retired. And he's not the only driver that has said that. Not the only driver that is worried he won't be remembered. Uh, it's a tough thing to get out of that car for good for a lot of reasons. But eventually, eventually, a driver realizes he has to do it for several reasons that he finally has to accept. Jeff eventually wound up at Roush Racing, where he worked with both Chad Little and Kurt Busch in the first few races of his Winston Cup career in the year 2000. He got an offer from Fox to start working in television, beginning with the 2001 season, and there he is, working with Daryl Walter again. <laughs> <laughs> Reconciliation. <laughs> and Steve... Like everybody else on that Fox broadcast team, his first race is the 2001 Daytona 500 and all the emotions that went along with that and their yeah. friendship and then the rocky part of their friendship and then the 2001 Daytona 500. But here's something that Jeff mentioned while he was discussing the 2001 Daytona 500. Jeff had been one of the very first people the Michael Waltrip's car when he wrecked during that just absolutely heart-stopping crash in the 1990 Bush Series race at Bristol. Yeah, I remember that wreck. You're talking about heart-stopping. That's exactly what it was. I didn't realize either that Jeff was one of the first to get to that car. And speaking of Jeff, just look at the Hall of Fame drivers and winners he worked with over the years. If you ask me, Jeff Hammond has compiled a very fine resume. Hello, Scene Vault fans. This is Brian from Speedway Screens. And if you're enough of a NASCAR historian to be listening to this podcast, there's a good chance a piece of the past you've been on the hunt for is in my shop. I'm constantly on the hunt for apparel and collectibles from all genres and eras of motorsports. So whether it be cup cars, dirt modifieds, dragsters, or monster trucks, I've probably got something for you. Check out my inventory at speedwaytsj.etsy.com and be sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Speedway Screens for the newest items as soon as they drop and for a peek at what I keep for my own collection. As a special thank you to listeners of this show, just enter scene at checkout for 10% off. Speedwaytsj.etsy.com. That's speedwaytsj.etsy.com. Steve, the April 9th, 1998 issue of Winston Cup scene, race and reference is always going to show that Mark Martin won Texas Motor Speedway's 1998 Winston Cup event and that Dell Earnhardt Jr. won his first ever Bush Series race the day before. But here's the thing about history. There was so much more that went on that weekend than just a couple of simple lines in the record book can truly encapsulate. This was the second major NASCAR race weekend at Texas. And to say that it was not smooth and easy, <laughs> that's a crazy understatement. There had already been complaints about turn four being too narrow and the racing groove being too close to the wall. But then a pretty infamous term in NASCAR lore was coined that weekend. I don't know if it was around before, but it certainly didn't become as big a deal <laughs> as what it became until this weekend in Texas. And that term was weeper. <laughs> and that term 
is very familiar now and has never left us. There was water coming up through the racetrack in turn one. Evidently, there had been a lot of rain and drainage was evidently an issue. But by the time all was said and done that weekend, first round qualifying for the cup race had to be waved off after a number of cars had problems. And then the happy hour final practice session was canceled outright. Between both the Winston Cup and Bush Series garages, Steve, get this. A total of 39 cars had been involved in accidents. 39 cars. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And when you consider that a full field for both of those divisions at that time was 43 cars, that's a lot of damage. And that's a lot of money down the drain. Yeah, it was an ongoing problem with that weeper. Water seeping onto the track that would not go away. And when the drivers went through that water, man, it just was unbelievable. They just couldn't hold on to it. Now, add to the fact that the fourth turn, in their opinion, was still too narrow. Then you got two somewhat dangerous spots on the track that they can't really avoid. Qualifying started on April 3rd two days before the race itself, but there was a sidebar in this issue that listed all the accidents that took place that day, Steve. You might want to sit back for this (laughs) because it's going to take a while. In Winston Cup practice, Kenny Wallace lost a tire and crashed in turn four. Billy Standridge hit the wall after hitting Speedy Dry on the track from Kenny's problem. Terry Labonte spun coming off turn four, slid through the tri-oval and hit the outside wall. Then in Winston Cup qualifying, Derek Cope spun in turn one and re-injured some broken ribs. Lake Speed crashed almost identically to Derek in turn one, and it was at that point where NASCAR said, no moss. (laughs) (laughs) And the rest of Winston Cup qualifying was moved to the next day. Then when Winston Cup qualifying was resumed the next day, Dick Trickle crashed in turn four in Bush Series practice on April 3rd. Matt Hutter, Mike McLaughlin, Hank Parker Jr., and Ted Smokestad all crashed, and Hank Jr. and Ted Smokestad were both hospitalized at Parkland there in Dallas overnight with concussions. And in addition to the concussion, Ted also had a fractured right shoulder blade. Then in Bush Series qualifying, Bobby Hillen and Tom Lawrence also crashed in turns one and two, and Tom was hospitalized overnight with a concussion. And given all of that, NASCAR was reaching its limit and was getting highly frustrated with the conditions that take us. As I mentioned in the intro, this was during a period when things weren't exactly hunky-dory between Bruton Smith and NASCAR. Bruton had fought tooth and nail to get Texas a NASCAR date, and then he was fighting tooth and nail to get Texas a second NASCAR date. And so what happened that weekend was basically like taking gasoline and throwing it on an open fire. And Steve, you and I both know, most of the time when an issue of some sort crops up at a racetrack, NASCAR and track management go into PR mode, and they say that they'll work on it together to come up with a plan and make things right. That did not happen here. (laughs) (laughs) And it went right to the very top. Bill France Jr., was asked if the problems Texas experienced that weekend would harm its chances for a second date. And he responded, the bigger question is, are we going to come back the first time? We're not even looking at something like that. We've got to get these drivers calmed down. Well, Mike Helton then doubled down on what Bill Jr. said, and he added, we've got a pretty big hammer and we're not afraid to use it. The hammer is that we don't come back. Does that make that any more clear? Forget a second date. The hammer is we don't come back, period. (laughs) The first time ever. (laughs) But Bruton Smith, uh, he he kept a pretty low profile that week for whatever reason. I don't know what was going on. Maybe he just wasn't feeling well legitimately, but he kept a pretty low profile. But he did tell reporters he knows we'll fix it. And by he, he's talking about Bill France Jr., of course. It's a new speedway, and I have never seen a new speedway that didn't have some problems. We have a $250 million investment here, so the next little bit of investment is not a problem. We'll cure it. 
Eddie Gossage was the track president, and he was squarely in the crosshairs that weekend. And you almost had to feel sorry for the poor guy right up until the point that somebody somewhere thought that it was a good idea to have t-shirts printed up that said, no crying, shut up and drive. <laughs> it, was, it was, it was that t-shirt with that slogan that really set Bill France off from what I hear. That's when he made a decision to fly up to Texas and straighten the mess out. Well, after that, most people, I think it was almost like, okay, Ed, <laughs> <laughs> yon, yon, brother. <laughs> and of course, I don't know that Eddie had anything whatsoever to do with the actual design and concept and, and approval of that t-shirt. I don't know where he was and all that, but the fact of the matter is that they did come out, they were available. And after that happened, it was like, okay, you're on an Island by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got news for you. Eddie was very much involved with that t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, hey, listen, I was giving him the benefit of the doubt. Okay. I'm not I quite the cynic that you are. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> However, <laughs> in this issue, Eddie said, I found out this morning that our crew for two weeks, since the French drains were put in, they went out every day and pushed compressed air into it and put heat to it. Yesterday, they looked at it and said, it's dry. Why are we doing this? And they didn't do it. Every morning they had been lowering the water table. By the end of the day, it comes back up, but not enough to seep through. Yesterday, they didn't do what it took to lower it, and it was high to start with. As the day went through, the water came up. When you change a variable, all of a sudden, you have a problem. And then Eddie was asked if somebody was going to be fired over what had happened. And I think Eddie had had just about enough of uh, everybody kind of snapping at him. And he kind of snapped back and said, not that I'm going to tell you about. It definitely wasn't Eddie because he just retired uh, a couple of weeks ago after many, many years at the track. And by the way, he served that track very well. There was no doubt about it that Eddie had full control of what was going on and knew his stuff. During the Winston Cup race itself, there was a multi-car crash on the second lap of the race. The year before, <laughs> about half the field had crashed going into turn one on the first lap. This time, they were able to make a full lap <laughs> before crashing. And then Mike Skinner and Greg Sachs were injured after being involved in two other mishaps. And Mike sustained a broken shoulder blade while Greg had to be cut from his car and was hospitalized in intensive care for observation after he was reporting his arm being numb. That was a pretty hectic weekend that week. Well, there was nothing dull about any of those Texas races. I'll tell you that. With all that being said, Mark Martin loved Texas. <laughs> he had won the inaugural Bush series race the year before, and he came for this cup race and he dominated. And not only that, but Rouse racing that day had a pretty doggone good day. Mark won. Chad Little, who was driving the number 97 John Deere car, he finished second with Jeff Hammond as his crew chief. Another Roush driver, Johnny Benson, who is now the pace car driver for XRX Racing, taking my job, but that's okay. I'm okay with it, I think. But Johnny Benson finished fifth. And Jeff Burton, another Roush Racing driver that day, he was leading when he crashed. If I remember correctly, during this time, the Roush cars were pretty darn good on all the 1.5 mile tracks. And I think they really showed it in that race. And Mark was not stepping lightly in his interview. He was banging as hard for Texas as many other people had been banging against Texas. He said in the race lead, I'm sick and tired of racetrack bashing. That's enough of it. I'm tired of it. I don't want to be led and led and led trying to lead me into saying something about the racetrack. Hey, we're here. We're going to race. By the way, I guess I've won 50% of the races here. It pays a lot of money. It's a great opportunity for our sponsors. It's a great opportunity for our competitors. It's a great opportunity for the race fans. How many people were here today? 
I bet they saw a great show. To me, it's like pounding a dead horse. That's behind us. What the racetrack is, is. We had a great race today. That's what I want to talk about. I don't want to talk about all that other stuff. I want to talk about the good things, the positive things. Well, not to take anything away from Mark, but he did win the race. And you're not going to see a winner bash the track <laughs> in his, his post-race interview very much. Also, Steve, Dale Earnhardt Jr., as we mentioned in the intro, he won the first race of his Bush Series career the day before the Winston Cup event. My son, Richard, was visiting from Nashville that weekend, so I didn't go to Texas that year. I wasn't there this weekend, so I missed covering all the fury that was going on with the racetrack, which was okay with me, (laughs) (laughs) but I also missed covering Dell Jr.'s first win. Well, let's put it this way, uh, Rick. We miss you, but we handled it just fine. I bet you did. (laughs) However. We did talk to Dale Jr. about that day and what it meant to his life and career back in episode 52. So you finished second at Las Vegas. Yep. You finished second at Bristol behind Elliott Sadler. Yeah. Then you go to Texas. Yeah. What do you remember about that? Well, I remember that we weren't, you know, we weren't all, we weren't really in position to win uh, for most of the day, we had a, we got in some contact in the middle of the race and had a tire rub that we had to come fix, lost a lot of track position because of that. But it was some real smart pit strategy late in that race that put us on newer tires, um, back in that series. So, you know, and then you had Mark Martin, who was unbeatable in the Winn-Dixie car. And if he wasn't, <laughs> if he wasn't there, then Joe Nemechek was there, who was unbeatable in his car. And, you're, you know, you're just trying your guts out to keep up with those two, two cars. And, uh, we got a chance to come down pit road and put on tires and, and Joe had the confidence in his car not to pit. And, you know, we took advantage of it, but I remember for whatever reason, uh, you know, I had run second a couple of times and I think that second place at Bristol, even though that was a great accomplishment for me, I personally got out of that car after Bristol and was like, I'm proud of myself. This is a hard race to finish. Yeah. I, I'm wrecking, I'm wrecking it Daytona and I'm, 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 you know, I'm having trouble finishing and completing races. And this is a tough one. Now, if I can finish second here and complete this race and run the laps and be good and not make mistakes and all the opportunities that you have to make mistakes at Bristol, I'm, ma- I'm making some gains, but I'm tired of running second already. And so I think that's why I maybe was more aggressive to get to get by Nemechek than I was with Spencer. Um, you know, in just that short period of time, a couple of weeks there, I had gained understanding of man, I'm going to have to force my way around these guys. They're not going to roll over and let you let you just have it. And he didn't want to. You know, he didn't want to move out of the way. But um, I just remember thinking that you know, in the middle of that race, man, we're going to have to work hard to get back in the top ten, get back in the top five to have a decent finish. Not thinking that we had a winning car, and then being you know on that late strategy, and when I mashed the gas and took off, I'm thinking, wow, this thing's faster than anything here. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. this, this uh, I'm the lead's right there, and I'm ca- I'm catching them. You know, I'm coming. Like yeah. we got to sh- we, we might win this race. You know, and so uh, and it all worked out. The funny thing is, is in my mind, I thought, I just need to win one race. If I can win one race, I'll have this job forever. That's all I try to – I'm thinking, I, I just want to win one race, and I'll have this job forever. I didn't think beyond that first win, you know, for whatever reason. That's just the mindset. That's the mentality that I had. And uh, I'm thinking, as soon as I won it, I'm like, this ought to keep me employed as a driver <laughs> yeah. for a really yeah. long time. Yeah. That was the thought. It wasn't – Winners the next race we're going to win, or man, I want to win the championship, or, or the, the only thought I had was dad's happy, and this sh- should do it. This should give me employment. Uh, I won't have to worry about my bills. You can ask Kelly. Up until the middle of '98, I was delinquent on bills. They were giving notices to me about shutting my power and my phone off. Um, we were, you know, we had, we were, I was minimum balance in the bank. You know, keeping that, you know, 200 bucks or whatever you had to have just a, so they didn't give you a fine, a penalty. Um, we won Texas, and I got a couple thousand dollars 
and went straight to the bank. I was living in a double wide trailer with a buddy of mine. We went, well, actually, we went straight to the power bill. Power, the, there was a strip mall where you paid your power bill. First race at Texas that we won, I got $2,000. We went and paid our power bill and we bought an entertainment system. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> Spent it all right there. And so, um, you know, I, I've, it was a big change in lifestyle. It was a big change in my bank account immediately. It all was overnight. Um, and I didn't know what I had. I didn't know what was coming. Uh, that's why Kelly ended up coming yeah. to work for me. Yeah. She's like, holy moly, all this is, you got, you, you need somebody. Cause there's, there was papers and bills and checks and things just piling up. And, uh, you know, so it was a bit of a whirlwind for me. Steve little did we know where Dell Jr. was going to go from there. No, we sure didn't, Rick. But I can tell you this. Dale Jr. got a lot of attention at the start of his career because of his name. But later on, he got stronger attention because of what he was doing on the racetrack. Steve, this issue also featured news that Tim Flock had died just a couple of months or so after being diagnosed with liver and lung cancer. Now, you knew Tim. What do you remember about him? He was a very friendly, funny guy. I could tell you, he could tell stories. Oh, my gosh. When he was down and talk about the way it used to be when he was in the sport, in the 50s and 60s, it's like he opened up a whole new world for you. Things you never knew and things about the people that were active back then that you really didn't know. So Tim was a great storyteller. Everybody liked him. Everybody. Here's another little piece of trivia. You remember the hotel that we stayed at in Richmond, the Holiday Inn there? Yeah. There was a racing collectible show there one year that we were there. And his wife, Frances, had a booth there. But Steve, what she also had were some old issues of Grand National Scene. And these were the ones that were still folded over and the one cover was on the outside and then you opened it up and there was like another cover on the inside. Right. I got my first few issues of old Grand National Scene from Francis Flock at that race and memorabilia show at the Holiday Inn in Richmond. And a star is born. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it was a star or an ulcer. I don't know. It was one of the two. <laughs> Steve, there was also a feature on Wendell Scott in this issue, and we just talked about him a few episodes ago, but what truly stood out on this story were some absolutely fantastic images of Wendell in his car that were shot by the legendary photographer, Don Hunter. Now, Steve, again, like Tim, I know that you knew Don. Yeah. So who was Don? Well, Don was, if I remember correctly, he was the official photographer for Charlotte Motor Speedway, but he went to many races. He and T. Taylor Warren were the pioneer photographers of NASCAR. They were the guys that you could see at about every race, and they were the guys that knew the sport and knew where to be to get the best shots. I think a lot of their shots were cars on the track, no doubt about that, but their best shots were personality shots, and people just liked their work. You mentioned the fact that they had the the eye for certain shots or whatever. Steve, Don's work, he was like an artist. I mean, he got some angles on stuff, and he had the clarity in his photos that were just absolutely brilliant. I mean, they were really and truly good stuff. Absolutely. That's where Don's strength was. I always thought that Don was one of the best personality photographers in the business, and I think you're going to give us an example of why. There was one photo that stood out the most to me, and these were way more than just a typical head and shoulders photograph. The one that stood out most to me is of Wendell getting out of his car, wearing a helmet, bubble goggles, standard work pants, and a short sleeve t-shirt. Yeah, I've seen that shot. That shot is exactly what Don Hunter was all about. He did not look for the ordinary. He looked for the extraordinary, and he found it. There was also another feature in this issue on the lifespan of a racing chassis. Dale Jarrett drove a Robert Yates racing forward to victory in that year's spring Darlington race. And the chassis had originally been constructed by that team in 1992. And Davey had also driven it to victory at Richmond in 1993 to capture the final Winston Cup win of his career. 
Ronnie Hopkins, the president of RHE Incorporated, a company that has built a lot of race cars over the years. Yeah. He said in this story, it's not the age of the chassis that matters. It's the condition. And man, I hope that goes for people too. <laughs> <laughs> I never knew that about chassis. Not a bit. I, I didn't realize that they could use a chassis over and over again, as long as that chassis was good condition of course the condition of a chassis is going to be basically determined by its quote-unquote wall count (laughs) (laughs) that's what i meant (laughs) which is the number of times it's reached out and touched the wall at some racetrack somewhere but more than that if a car impacted with either the front of the car or the back it could be fairly easily repaired with a new front snout or a rear clip and you're back in business But Paul Andrews, who was working at Penske Cranifus Racing with Jeremy Mayfield at the time, he said it was only when the center box of the car, where the driver sits, when that was bent, that's when you basically trashed a car. Jeff Gordon had driven a chassis that the team called Blacker at that point to 12 of his 31 career victories. That car was built in August 1994, and it was the first of the new 1995 Monte Carlos that Ray Evernham and the rest of the Hendrick Motorsports team had constructed. So teams get their favorite cars, and if it's at all possible, if they get in an accident, they're going to try to fix it up as best they can. Here's a note on a former Winston Cup chassis for you. The first time that I did the fast track driving school was at Atlanta in 1991, and according to what I was told there, one of the cars that I drove that weekend was the same chassis that Bobby Allison had won with in the 1988 Daytona 500. Well, how about that, Rick? I trust you didn't crash that car down there. I I didn't go fast enough to crash it. (laughs) (laughs) That's what I thought. (laughs) There were still more features in this issue on teams searching for sponsorship, Bill France Sr., and one feature in this issue featured a poll that had been conducted about which networks did the best job in covering the sport. Now, you want to take a stab at which network at that time got the best rating as you look at the notes? (laughs) (laughs) I would have guessed this anyway. had to be ESPN. At that time, according to this poll, 76.1% favored ESPN. 20.5% liked TNN. one8 percent said tbs and less than one percent each said cbs abc or none of the above not surprising if i remember correctly while most of the networks did have additional racing shows shows other than the race itself i think espn was at the forefront at the time with several of those kinds of shows and that enhanced their popularity Well, ESPN also had Bob Jenkins, Benny Parsons, and Ned Jarrett. Okay, enough said. (laughs) There you go. There will never be a better booth than that one. That will always be the soundtrack of my early NASCAR years. But Steve, I had to laugh when I saw the pull quote on this story. Now, pull quote, if you're not familiar with that term, a pull quote is a quote that appears in the middle of the story in bigger type, and it's kind of offset. And almost like a photo in the story. Oh, so that's what they call it. (laughs) (laughs) And the pull quote came from Sharon Daniel from Timberville, Virginia. Sharon wrote in and said, asking which network does the best job of covering races is like asking which fly (laughs) you would like to have removed from your soup. (laughs) 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 Okay. So Sharon evidently didn't think a whole lot of NASCAR broadcasting at the top. When it comes to television, the fans are going to have their own opinions and their own favorites, and you're not going to be able to change your minds. I'll tell you, back at that time, there was a lot of choice for the fans when it came to networks doing television. So naturally, there were going to be a lot of opinions, a lot of flies in that soup. (laughs) (laughs) I am going to go way out on a limb here, and I'm more than likely going to risk ticking some people off, but... If I ever found a genie in a bottle who gave me three NASCAR wishes, one of the first ones that I would wish for would be this. 
I would put some of these people who complain the loudest about this TV announcer or that one, I would put them in the booth on air for a race. And they would find out right quick that that job is not nearly as easy as what it evidently appears to be for so many people. No, I agree with you on that one, Rick. It is not. Those guys have to know their stuff and they have to react quickly and describe quickly what's going on. And it's not rehearsed. Everything is done as it happens. Not easy at all. It is not in my DNA to be able to think that quickly on my feet in describing what I see. I'm a print journalist for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, the TV I have done, Rick, was always taped. It was never live from the booth at a racetrack. So in that sense, I had very, very lucky. I could not do what they do in the booth. Hey, race fans, this is Shauna Robinson, and you're listening to the Scene Vault Podcast. Steve, anybody who has listened to this podcast for any time at all, they know that I kind of live in two different worlds. I live in the NASCAR world, and I also live in the NASA world. And in a couple of weeks, Jeannie and I are headed out to an event in Tucson, Arizona called Space Fest. And Steve, that's a big event where astronauts come to sign autographs and moonwalkers and flight controllers and authors and all kinds of people come and sign autographs, sign books, sign DVDs, whatever. I will be doing some book signings, but I'll also be moderating a panel with several of my mission control friends that I've made over the years. So I'm looking really forward to that. But that means that I'm going to be out of town week after next when you and I would normally record. So I've kind of come up with a plan B for that week's episode. <laughs> uh -oh. And I'm not quite sure how it's going to turn out. <laughs> what we have done, Steve, we have put together a roundtable discussion with Buddy Parrott Tony Rambo Liberati, Chris Hussey, and Jerry Kennan at Rambo's house this week. And the week that I'm gone, that conversation is going to be our episode. My plan is to hit record and let it roll. <laughs> so I don't know how it's going to turn out, but dang, man, with that cast of characters on board, there is no telling what might happen. I have a sneaky suspicion the fans are going to love this one. <laughs> <laughs> or never listen to us again. I don't know. One or the other. One or the other. <laughs> so this week, we finish up with Jeff Hammond. Next week's episode will be the first part of our interview with Shauna Robinson. And then the week after that will be the roundtable discussion. Good stuff coming up. I'll tell you that. I didn't realize we were going to do more things here. Well, when you when you told me, uh, when you challenged me uh, on on just having eleven pages pages of questions, you I, said twelve. I, I took it as a personal challenge. <laughs> okay. I, I will say this: this is this is the longest interview I think I've ever done. But I, I appreciate you. No, I'm being patient. I don't want to be just the longest. I want to be the best. <laughs> <laughs>